and welcome to the latest Duke Law Audio Roundtable. I'm Ebony Bryant, Director of Diversity Initiatives at Duke Law School. In this episode of the Duke Law Audio Roundtable, we are observing National Hispanic Heritage Month. The national holiday that started in 1968 began on September the 15th and ends on October the 15th. It's intended to celebrate the histories, cultures, and contributions of American citizens whose ancestors come from Spain, Mexico, the Caribbean, and Central and South America. In recent years, however, a different title for this holiday has started to trend, National Latinx Heritage Month. With term Latinx first gaining popularity amongst younger generations around the early 2000s. In the U.S., Hispanic and Latinx also exist alongside related terms Latino and Latina, which entered common usage during the 1990s. Now, as many of us are taking steps to be more conscious about using correct terms to identify ethnic groups, there's a growing confusion and debate in the U.S. about the correct usage of the terms Hispanic, Latino, Latina, or Latinx. Today, I'm joined by three guests from the Duke Law community who will help us better understand these terms to share which ones they prefer and why, and to explain why using correct terminology matters for lawyers today. So first, I am honored to welcome Sofia Hernandez. She's a senior assistant city attorney with the city of Durham and senior lecturing fellow here at Duke Law. Sophia entered, earned, excuse me, her JD from the law school and has a Bachelor of Arts in English and Cultural Anthropology from Seattle University. Thank you so much for joining us, Sophia. Happy to be here. Wonderful. Next, we have Alyssa Reyes, a second-year law student at Duke Law. Alyssa earned a Bachelor of Arts in Media Studies from the University of California at Berkeley and a Master's in Education from the City University of New York, Hunter College. This summer, Alyssa worked as a legal intern for the Mexican-American Legal Defense and Educational Fund. At Duke Law, she serves as the president of Duke Law's Latin American Law Students Association. Hello, Alyssa. Hi, thank you for having me. And finally, my third guest is Alejandro Feyes, an LLM student at Duke Law. Alejandro hails from Costa Rica and graduated from the Universidad Escuela Libre de Derecho. He used to work as a legal assistant and attorney for BLP Legal. At Duke Law, Alejandro is a 3L representative for Duke Law's Latin American Law Students Association. Welcome, Alejandro. Thank you so much for having me to this afternoon here. Thank you all for taking the time to be a part of this roundtable discussion We have quite a bit to talk about today, so let's dive right in. First, to help frame our discussion, I'd like to first define what the terms Hispanic, Latina, Latino, and Latinx mean. Uh, Sophia, uh, would you like to respond? Absolutely. As, As far as I understand the terms Hispanic and Latino and Latinx, Hispanic is used to refer to Spanish-speaking countries and um, and Spain. Um, and so really the, the key distinction there is Hispanic would not include references to Brazil and p- people from Brazil. Um, Latin or Latino is used for those folks who are, originate from Latin American countries. So in that case, Spain would not be included. The term Latinx, which we've seen and you mentioned, has become more common in the last 20 years, has been a development to create a gender neutral alternative to Latino or Latina. So there's some interesting dynamics in even that discussion, right? So Alyssa, I know that you have some thoughts. Please share uh, with us. I think Latinx as a concept has taken form from this information age and the newer generation's access to information and their desire to be more inclusive. As a member of the LGBTQ community, I take every opportunity I can to make my non-binary, non-gender conforming uh, community members 
to make them feel comfortable and and safe and seen. And so I was someone who adopted Latinx pretty rigorously, uh, especially in areas of academia, uh, which we can talk about why uh, specifically. However, I am now a firm believer that Latinx is probably not the best way to describe our community uh, presently. Alejandro, I'm going to include you in this conversation, I think, because you have um, a different perspective coming from Costa Rica. What are your thoughts about using the term Latinx? Uh, back home, it's not a term that it has been like used that much so far. It's something new. It's something that the people are catching up right now in Twitter, in different platforms. But we haven't had like this discussion as that discussion that they are having today of saying, okay, maybe this term doesn't uh, represent our community. Back in in my country, and I think it's pretty similar in Central America, there's still like a big part of the population that they don't understand the, the term at all. It's just like, oh yeah, you're saying Latino, wrong, right? <laughs> Most of uh, like old people or older generations, they see the term, they heard, they hear the term and they're like, yeah, I think you just misspelled the word or you mispronounce it. So we don't have like this discussion right now over here. Anthony, could I, could I add? Um, and, and I completely agree. I think that and it actually makes me feel Great to hear younger folks saying so, because I worried that I was part of that older generation that isn't quite accepting uh, of Latin X. You know, I think it's so important that language uh, respects individuals' identity. And certainly if someone identifies themselves as Latin X to me, that that is something that I will use to reference to them. But I think as a collective, Latin X doesn't fit within our language, the Spanish language, right? We don't end words with equis, and it would be incredibly, like, it is a hard and clunky sounding word. And so it felt as if it was a term assigned to the Latino community that is hard to rep to pronounce, and you're asking folks to define themselves that way. And I think that that's really problematic, that assigning of a label. Um, so I just wanted to add that. No, I think that's a good... Um way to say it. I think just even in us having this conversation prior to going live, um, we talked about the way to pronounce it. it just in general, it's not um, fluent to to say Latinx or Latinx. It, you think about it, right? So I want to talk a little bit about how people in the U.S. prefer terms. Um, so according to an August 2021 Gallup poll, 23% of people prefer the term Hispanic. 15% prefer the terms Latino or Latina, 4% prefer the term Latinx, and 57% have no preference. So does it surprise you that only 4% say they prefer Latinx or that more than 50% say they have no preference? Um, and I don't think any of you said what you prefer um, for yourselves. So I'll start with Alyssa, kind of change the order a little bit. Thank you. I have many thoughts on this. First and foremost, it doesn't surprise me that only 4% prefer the term Latinx because, as Sophia mentioned, it's so difficult to use in everyday speech. And to come to defense for some of the progressives who really worked hard to implement Latinx, I will say that language is ever-evolving. Culture is ever-changing. And if I've discovered or learned anything from this new generation's method of advocacy, it's that they're willing to try things. And if they fail, they're receptive to that. And I think therein lies a little of the differences between the generations and our adoption of different terms. Um, however, I will admit that this gender binary is really oppressive for some people. It's, it's almost dangerous for certain people, uh, especially those who are still grappling with issues of their identity. So as difficult as it is, I'm actually 
uh, hopeful by the 57% of people who have no preference because that leads me to believe that they are open to finding something that works for, let me be clear, American vocabulary and an American way to identify certain communities and cultures. Whether or not it'll stick in Latin America and in other areas of the world is different. However, we have to acknowledge that there are so many people in America who come from these cultures. That being said, something that is gaining steam is the term Latin, or as some people say, Latine, or Latine, however you want to pronounce it. Um, I was actually abroad this summer and met a gender non-binary person who said that his, my apologies, who said that their progressive colleagues were using Latine because it's so gender neutral and easy to conjugate in Spanish. And is a result, a product of the failure of Latinx. Um, and I just worry that certain people who are resistant to changing or modifying the term, um, that it comes from a very patriarchal, misogynistic um, place, which is evident among our culture and within it. It, it was honestly a big surprise for me to see that there's so low, uh, there's a, such a low rate of, of acceptance for Latinx. Uh, honestly, I thought here in the States, there was like more approval to the term. Uh, seeing that 57% of the people, they really don't care or they, they don't mind the term. It was something that uh, it happens back home. Like at the end of the day, I know that a lot of people are fighting right now to get out these new inclusive terms to change the mentality or ide ideology of the people. But like there's a huge chunk of, of, of people right now, uh, at least in Latin America, that they don't see this fight, right? That they are suffering some other things back home, poverty or drugs or whatever. So at the end of the day, even though they think this is a big fight, they have this fight at the end of their priority list. So it's hard, I know, to to start like changing this this mindset because people are not open to it. So uh, I think the new term that you mentioned, Alyssa, uh, Latin or Latine, I think it will it would have more traction in the future for sure because as we mentioned it's more natural like you feel that it's like a word in spanish not lat, lat, uh, latinx that from the beginning just reading the the word i'm from costa rica and i was like okay how i pronounce pronounce this like this is weird i think at least with this new term um uh, people are going to be more receptive but i think at least from Leaving aside the United States, that it's a whole other culture from the point of view of Latin America, Central America, South America, it's going to be a little bit slower. But it's something that you need to keep working every single day. I think it's interesting because I think, um, as you've talked about, the term being assigned, if you will, that um, it will be cultural in, in driving how what it is, but America at large will have to also get on board. And that is always the challenge um, for people of color um, to be able to own the identity that they choose versus what has been assigned to them. I think it goes across cultures. Um, so this is, I think, an important discussion to have um, that will lead the way for a lot of groups um, of people of color. So would you like to add anything, Sophia? Yes. Um, well, first I want to answer the question, what I prefer. And I prefer Latino. Okay. And I think of Latino as a uh, non-gendered term personally, um, though I, of course, understand and respect uh, the concerns about, you know, the binary um, gendered words that we have in our Spanish language. And I think that for me, it, you know, I, I prefer Latino because it is a Spanish word and it's proud and it's strong. 
But I would say the non-gendered equivalent would be Latin, Latin American, uh, instead of Latino Americano, Latin American. And so I think when I first heard of Latinx, there was this question of, did we need this word if we're all agreeing to the root Latin, right, whether it's Latino, Latina, Latinx, Latine, then to remove the gender, could we not just agree on Latin? And I think that if we did that, you'd have more of the older generations on board who may resist change, as well as you would recognize that um, the issues that exist in a, in a very patriarchal language and culture. So I guess, you know, that is that is something that I struggle with definitely as a as a professor and as a pseudo mom of a 21 year old that I have at home, my niece, um, I try to be very respondent and and respective of of self identity, because I think that that's important, especially in a younger generation, like how you identify and how you relate to the world based on that identity is so crucial. Um, but I can't say that I, I felt that a new word was necessary. And I will certainly agree with Alyssa that language is so evolving and changing. And I think that that's where you see, you know, in, in the 50s and 60s, we were all referred to as Spanish, right? And the hard fought win was the term Hispanic. And that became such a win. And certainly for that generation, I think, especially. Puerto Ricans, Cubans, and Mexicans who were in this country, that term is still preferred by them because they associate that term with a win, with this is the way that we were now seen, right? In the 19, in 1980s, Hispanic got on the census. And then 20 years later, we're talking about the term Latino. And that's when my family first immigrated to this country in the late 80s and early 90s. And Latino was seen as the win. And in two, I think it was 2000 is when we first saw Latino on the census. So it'll be interesting to think about what this next 20 years is going to hold as far as language. And, and I agree that having our government see us for whatever label we as a community fight for is going to be really important. Thank you all for your responses. I think the term has almost evolved during our conversation. Um, and I think that's important because it represents, you know, identity for individuals and how it can be a challenge to assign one term for a whole range of people. Um, you will always have people that um, want something different, right? Um, so now we have two of you that are currently taking classes at Duke Law. And Sophia, you are a Duke Law alum and a, a professor now. So what has been your experience with how these terms show up in the classroom, um, classes you attend or attended, as well as the classes that you teach? I know this is early on in the semester when you all are hearing this. Um, so Alyssa, go ahead. I will admit that this term presents itself infrequently. I think that's not by chance. The legal profession is not inclusive of people of color, especially how we study it in law school, which is very much so from a historical perspective, which essentially ignores our voices. However, it's interesting to see when the topic does come up, who is using Latinx and who is using Hispanic. And I think that, as Sophia was saying, language evolves with movements of the time. And just like Latino is a response to Hispanic becoming a slur, how SPIC became a slur uh, from this colonial term, and we responded with Latino, or as my mother reminds me, Chicano, as a Mexican from Los Angeles, there are subdivisions. Latino, Latin American, Hispanic will never encompass everybody. And I think that's where we're at right now. It's not even so much that Latin or Latine will be appropriate going forward. It's about why we're having this dis these discussions. I think it has a lot to do with 
the transphobia that is currently immersed in our politics, um, especially in states really close to us. Uh, and so I am looking forward to the evolution of it, and I'm certainly doing my part in class to make this evolution and this progress sh clear and shown. I think I have a similar experience so far. Uh, honestly, it's not a term that you usually hear in class that we discuss. Like, so far, I have been here like nine months. And I'm pretty sure that I haven't heard that term so far in the in a class, at least a professor talking about it. So, yeah, it's it has been weird for me because coming back, uh, coming from Latin America, it's something really usual, right? I come from the part where we're like part of the uh, population. I don't know here. I'm in a, a minority. So it has been like kind of a shock uh, sometimes that how you change from being like a regular person to here being maybe a little bit more invisible that we are not not like they don't talk about mo uh, about us that much or they just sometimes are like oh yeah. Keep quiet, keep, uh, keep on, a, uh, stay like on, on the side, don't get involved. Like you are here, enjoy the ride and everything else, but we are not uh, hoping anything else from you. So yeah, during, during my classes, it has been, it was quite a surprise, honestly, that, that this term doesn't matter, Hispanic, Latino, Latina, Latin, Latin uh, Latinx, it doesn't come around simply. Sophia, in your classes you teach, but then also your memory, you know, since you've been out of law school. Which wasn't that long ago. Oh, it was recent. <laughs> um, gosh, uh, hearing you both, that's, uh, thank you for your fair, honest, you know, sharing. And that's a little heartbreaking and very poignant comments that you make. And, and I do think that we're probably see that across the country in a lot of law schools, um, that you kind of come into law school and sort of, you know, like stripped of your identity because you're here just to soak everything up that the professors are giving you. Um, you know, and I, and I think it's interesting that generally in smaller classes when we're talking, you know, 40 or less, you usually have this exercise in the beginning of like, tell me where you're from or what your hobbies are. Um, and it wouldn't be that difficult to add you know, tell me what you identify as, tell me your preferred pronouns, so that from the get-go, the professor is saying that is important. That is a part of the perspectives and the voices that you bring into this classroom. Um, and I certainly, day one of, you know, my class, when I introduced myself to to my, um, to my kids, to the, my students, um, I, you know, I was like, I'm Latina. I was born in Honduras. I immigrated when I was seven. English is my second language. And I put that out there because it is part of my identity and because I want them to be aware of where I'm coming from and my perspectives. Um, but I will say that, that it isn't a term that my students say back to me very much. Uh, admittedly, I only have 29 students in the current class that I'm teaching. And I assume only one of them identifies as Hispanic or Latino or Latinx. Um, when I was here in law school, and that was, you know, 15 to 12 years ago, uh, actually, LALSA was called HELSA. Mm -hmm. And I remember being here in law school and not loving that, but also not feeling empowered enough to even think about changing something like that. And so, again, I think that we see this evolution now that HELSA is LOSA. And, and I love that. And I, you know, applaud the students that work towards that change. And I hope that they, you know, whatever the next, you know, identifying term that feels right to them in the future, that that also is something they fight to change. It's just historically, I think, that shift from HILSA to LALSA um, was very intentional and very much student-led. The general law school just did not think, you know, could this be problematic? This is what 
we call this group of people, we're going to call it Hilsa. Um, and so I just remember it being very much powerful because the students just said, this is what our new name is. And I loved it. <laughs> That's an aside for those of you that are listening, but I think it speaks to um, even the shift in power um, because the students took their name back. They took a stand to say, this is how we want to be identified as a group. And then the the law school followed behind. So that gives us a little bit of, okay, maybe we continue to fight um, for for what we think is right. So I think the the tag onto that, and I'll direct it to you, Sophia, to start off is, you know, in in the practice of law, do you think it's important to use the it's obviously important to use the appropriate terminology, but when you think about the historic historical aspect of the law, and a lot of case law is using old terms across a lot of different mm -hmm. racial and ethnic groups. Um, but um, can you talk a little bit about the importance of using the appropriate terminology in the practice of law? Um, well, certainly it is incredibly important, again, because the appropriate terms, these labels, these identifiers are a way that we show that we see individuals and respect them. And so I think that any, whether it's a law firm, government, nonprofit, whatever kind of entity uh, has the responsibility to put in the work to see these terms and use these terms, both as far as recruiting and good service to the community. Um, and and then I want to say that, you know, it's important for us to feel empowered to have those conversations if we don't see that they're happening. I've certainly had the conversation with my colleagues of Latino versus Hispanic and you know, they're like, so what's the deal? And like, what do you prefer? And sometimes they're afraid to ask, but, at, you know, we've had those conversations and I, I think that they're important. Um, so Alyssa, entering in, you know, what what are your thoughts about in the, pra the practice of law using the correct terminology? I think about this a lot because of how long certain lawyers practice, especially if they're in positions that are lifetime appointments. Um, progress is inevitable and change is inevitable. And I think it's imperative that the law evolves in a way that represents the truth at that time. I understand that certain people are resistant to change, especially, for example, with pronouns that may be plural. It doesn't sit right for a law student or a lawyer's brief when uh, we're very type A and, and precise with our language. However, as we evolve and become more inclusive of communities as a whole, as Sophia said, it's, it's so important to recognize people for who they are and to ask for their consent for how they want to be identified. I think it's it's inevitable, but it's going to take time. Alejandro, would you like to add anything? I think uh, it's going to, like, okay, uh, in law, we need to be precise, as you were mentioning, and it's something basic. But I also see that, like, going a little bit back with our discussion, like, the term has been evolving, right? And basically, the law is always behind society. It's like two steps behind. Law is the natural answer to the changes in our society. So I think it's going to be really hard for the law to be at that point at the correct moment, right? Because probably like, I don't know, 20 years from now, it's going to be using some term like more adequate, but probably at that moment, our society has is going to be in another stage. So I think it's going to be really, really hard for lawyers, uh, for us in the future to be like at the same level that we are waiting or hoping in our society that it's kind of, even though it's hard to change like 
old people or people that don't want to change, but at the end, it, it is faster. With the law, I think it's going to be like really, really complicated to be at that point. But as you were mentioning, I think it's necessary. Like, even though it's hard, we cannot quit. We cannot say like, oh yeah, it's not going to happen. So we don't care. No, like we need to do it like every single day. We need to fight for it. And uh, one of the things that Sofia mentioned before is that we are proud when we say that we are Latinos, Latin, whatever. And that's something that should be reflected in law, in our practice and everything else. We are proud people. If we were born here with family from Latin America or we, we come directly from Latin America, every single person that I have seen here and they identify themselves as Latino, you can see the proud that they have when they say like, yeah, I'm from Latin America, I'm Latino, I'm Latina, I'm Latinx. And we need to bring that fire to our jobs, to our practices, to our courts, even though it's going to be hard. I love that. I got chills. I love that. I think what else is there to say? I think it's um, to be proud is something powerful, something that you teach the next generation. Um, and, and that is echoed in how they identify uh, and the term that they use. Um, so is, does anyone have any final words? I don't know if I'll say that this is a final word. So if you want to edit this in front of what he said <laughs> to leave it as his last, that's cool too. Um, no, but I, I think, and Alyssa, you you mentioned this a bit too, that there is not going to be one word that encompasses 20 countries across three continents. And so we recognize to a certain extent that as we're working towards terms, not that the effort is futile, because it is not, we still need to do it, but that this idea of a perfect term or the right term is, um, maybe doesn't exist, but that there can still be a more appropriate term, a more embraced term than um, than what we have now. Uh, Alyssa? I think that we're living in a day and age in which people expect change immediately. I think that we have glorified individuals without necessarily checking their credentials. Um, and it's hard to realize that the adoption of these terms takes years, has historically taken sometimes a decade. And so while we we need patience, I think we also need to be cognizant of this cancel culture when it comes to change that people don't immediately understand. And that is the final word. <laughs> um, I am so grateful, Sophia, Alyssa, Alejandro, for you taking the time to share and to be vulnerable because I think um, it takes something to speak. Often we ask people to speak on behalf of a group of people, and that's very difficult to do. Um, but I really appreciate um, the discussion and your openness um, and willingness to share your hearts and your thoughts today. Um, it, this is an important topic, one that is ongoing. Um, and I think that we will revisit it again. And it could be in years. It could be tomorrow. Um, but I appreciate your your time. Thank you all for listening to the Duke Law Roundtable. We wish you well and goodbye. <laughs>